We're back with another episode of Reference Points. I'm joined by Eric Wind, longtime Hodinkee friend, former contributor and the proprietor of Wind Vintage. Today, we're gonna to take a look at the Rolex Explorer 1, one of the most important sports watches that Rolex has ever made, and a watch that has had a continuous history pretty much from its origins in the early 1950s through today. Eric, welcome. Thank you so much, John. The important thing with reference points is really to educate people about the evolution of these models. And you can compare the earliest examples to the most recent and really see the core Rolex DNA there. So we have 34 fantastic Explorer models. We're gonna start with early Explorers, reference 6150, 6350, and 6610. Then we're going to look at the reference 1016 with gilt dials and with matte dials. Next, we'll look at Explorer-like watches. And after that, the reference 14270, the reference 114270, the 39 millimeter, 214270. And then we're gonna finish with the current generation, the 124270 and the two-tone 124273. Eric, let's kick it off with the earliest models. So you have the earliest model, the Mercedes hour hand is kind of longer. Some people would say the 6150 isn't the first true explorer because there are other dial variations for that reference. Then you have the 6350. The 6350 is kind of special in this particular example, has a waffle dial where it's textured and there are wide variations within a very tight serial range for this model. This one has pencil hands. There are versions with Mercedes hands as well. These are probably the most desirable and expensive Explorer models to this day. And the waffle dial is also sometimes referred to as the honeycomb dial? Exactly. Honeycomb or waffle, black texture, only seen on this reference. Really stunningly beautiful. The succeeding reference was the 6610. The earliest version has a red depth rating below Explorer, which says 50 meters, 165 feet. And that's kind of a dark red, so it's not even that visible today. It's very subtle. Then we have what people call an albino model which is a white dial. Very rare to find a white dial 6610 or 1016. It could be considered, you know, one of the rarest Explorer variations. Then you have the final run of 6610s and just showing the kind of minor variations that collectors love. This one's slightly earlier with a lollipop seconds hand where it's a very large luminous circle mm. toward the end of the seconds hand. And then the very last version with a smaller seconds hand in terms of the luminous circle on it. That's very cool. And so now we're jumping into the 1016, which is a reference that had an incredibly long run in a number of variations. And so we brought a lot of them. Yes. Um, can we dive into the earliest gilt dial 1016s? The very earliest ones, like the watches that preceded it, has a chapter ring, which means you see the full circle mm -hmm. around the minute and second dashes. In general, most say superlative chronometer officially certified. Ian Fleming famously owned a 1960 1016. Some consider the quintessential James Bond watch because that's what he referenced in the books. You have a version that followed, which is the exclamation point, where there's a small dot below the six at six o'clock. Mm -hmm. And that indicates, according to kind of collector lore, that the mixture used for the loom is not as radioactive as the versions that preceded it. Then there's kind of a funky, unusual one where it's got both an exclamation point and an underline, which you never see with a Submariner or GMT Master. It's only known on a few examples of the Explorer. We don't know exactly why they did this, but this watch came out of Mexico. It's got a little bit of a tropical look to the dial as well, where it's turning brown. Very close serial number to these. You have an underline model with the small underline before the superlative chronometer officially certified text. That underline 
According to collector lore indicates that it's tritium loom, no radioactive elements at all to the luminous material. To follow, you've got the last versions of the gilt dials for 1016. Everything up to this point, except for the white dial, has a gilt dial where we refer to the text being in gold. This is a Mark V gilt explorer. Some people originally thought these Mark V explorers were reprinted dials because the text almost looks handwritten when you look closely at it. It's more of a funky kind of stylized writing. Then you have the Mark IV and Mark VI dials, and we have three here. Why do we have three? Well, just to kind of show how aging can be a little bit different. This Mark IV has gold pans, is in very beautiful condition, and the dial remains kind of that jet black that Rolex refers to in the ads for these. You have kind of a dark tropical where Time and UV and heat has kind of made it a dark brown color. Just to show you how aging can change these things, we have a very light tropical where it's got almost a caramel color. Uh, this watch came out of Rwanda. Collectors, of course, love tropical anything where the dial's turning brown. Okay, so that's the 1016 with gilt dials. That takes us through about 1966, 1967. Now let's jump into the matte dials. Exactly. So right around then, Rolex transitioned from these gilt glossy dials to a matte black with white printing. The very earliest matte dials for the 1016 have what we call a frog foot Mark I coronet. The loom is very puffy and kind of a large 369. You've got a version also with a very close serial number where the loom is a little bit flatter and even wider. This is kind of an interesting example because it was awarded to a cowboy named Gary Lefew for winning the Calgary Stampede for bull riding in 1969. It's featured on his wrist in a Rolex ad for the Canadian market, a print ad. A year or two later, he had it in his gear bag and a bull stepped on the bag. So this example had the crystal shattered and it stayed that way until recently. So that's an actual Rolex watch that appeared in a Rolex print ad. Yes. I can't think of anything like that. Yeah, it's pretty phenomenal and uh, an important piece of history. And this is a Mark I frog foot coronet as well, like the previous two, but the loom is kind of thinner. The numbers are wider. It's got a more distinct look that follows the later 1016s than those early models with the fat loom. This example is a Mark II dial, which is a very tight serial run. Again, one of those things collectors had to kind of suss out and figure out if it was real or not, because some people thought these were reprinted. This one, the coronet, actually resembles more of the coronet shape of the gilt watches that preceded it. If the watch looks familiar to you, it's because it was in Fred Savage's Talking Watches. For my 40th, my wife got me a 1016. Oh, that's amazing. And because she got it for me. I felt like that was a blessing to open up a whole nother world. When Jennifer got that for me, it was also kind of inspired by my, by my dad about if there's something you really love, you know, go for it. This is a Mark III. This particular example has a little bit wider loom. You're kind of approaching toward the end of the 1016 run as it evolves with time. And of course, they're all very special. Bunny Melon Explorers. They were all purchased at Tiffany & Co. So they're kind of grail explorers. They all have a beautiful loom color as well. It's a really special piece of history. I'll say. And then we have the last of our matte dials. Yeah, this is a Mark V. They continued with the 1016 from 1960 to about 1989. 
you see the last versions have more of a white loom. And so that does it for the 1016, as you mentioned, taking us all the way from 1960 to 1989. Now let's get into some Explorer-like watches. What do we mean yeah. by that? So there are certain principles as we've kind of seen with the Explorer, the 369, the, the fact that for these earlier models, they're fully luminous. These are all similar in some respect to these, but there's a few differences. Um, this model is a reference 5500 Explorer with a gilt dial from 1966. This is 34 millimeters, however, and says precision on the dial. The vast majority of 5500s you see will say Air King on the dial. This was kind of an interesting test run in the mid 60s. This is also one of the most faked watches because you could take an Air King and put in an Explorer fake dial and then charge a lot more money. So you need to be very careful. You know, I get Instagram messages from people all the time asking, is this a real Explorer 5500? And I'm like, no, I'm sorry, it's not. <laughs> uh, so it's nice to have a real example to show. Almost all of the real ones have this gilt dial. If you see a matte dial one, you have to be pretty suspect, I would say. Another kind of legendary watch in this family is the Space Dweller, which is a reference 1016. It's one of those watches, kind of like the blueberry insert, where there's a lot of lore around it. This particular example has a dial that was sold loose by Sotheby's and then was put in a case. Then the final two, um, which is the version that says Commando and then the sterile version. These are 34 millimeter watches, incredibly popular and valuable these days. There's an ad for the Commando being sold at Abercrombie and Fitch wow. around 1969. I think the retail was $115 at the time. Probably a bit more now. Yeah, and so the Commando, funnily enough, was the kind of the civilian version. They weren't putting that on watches sold in the US military bases. This was sold at a US military base says nothing other than Rolex Oyster. It's just a very simple, inexpensive watch, but as you can imagine, collectors love it. And so now we're looking at the 14270. So we're pick, more or less picking up where the 1016 left off. Um, and this is much more of a, a modern watch. It is, yeah. Still 36 millimeters, but a, and a, still chronometer certified. Still chronometer course. certified, but a very interesting reference nonetheless. Yes. So you have the very earliest 14270s were called the blackout models. They were E and X serial numbers only. That's kind of the most desirable class of the Sapphire Crystal Explorers. These have drilled lugs for quick removal of the bracelet. Same with the early 14270s. This also has drilled lugs and tritium dial. And then they switch to the solid lugs where you could not stick a tool in the side to replace the bracelet. But you know, an important thing to point out nonetheless, because this is really Rolex becoming like modern Rolex. Exactly. In, in a way, uh, yep. going away from the, from the, drilled, the drilled hole. All of these yeah. previous models have the drilled holes in the lugs. This one still has tritium. So you see the T on the dial and this version is Swiss only uh, from circa 1999. It was Luminova, then Rolex switched to the Super Luminova models. After the 14270, we have the 114270, which has a different movement. And they're extremely similar to the 14270, except you'll see Swiss made below six o'clock indicating Super Luminova mm -hmm. is the luminescent material used. And it was 36 millimeters as well. Then everything kind of changed when Rolex went to the 214270. And so these are the only two watches on this table that are larger than 36 millimeters. Correct, yep. They're 39 millimeters. It did cause quite a kerfuffle when it was introduced. This early version has what we call the short hands, where the hand does not extend all the way to the minute track. Also, the three, six, and nine are fully white gold on the dial. Then you switch to the version that was just recently discontinued, which has the wider, longer, and fatter hands, and the three, six, and nine have 
loom in them that's visible. And then what we have left are the two modern versions of the Rolex Explorer 1. Rolex is back to its 36 millimeter size. It surprised a lot of people. That they, yeah, they, they still managed to surprise people. Yeah. The version on the left, it is very close to the 14270 and 114270. Has a slightly different clasp. Notably has a coronet between Swiss and made at six o'clock. That's probably the easiest and fastest tell. Mm -hmm. And then one of the more controversial watches, of course, was the introduction of the two-tone Rolasor model. It's the only one on the table you'll see with any gold accents. It certainly remains very controversial. Yeah, I mean, it's a cool watch. Steven did a great review of it, and we'll link that up uh, in the article. We have pretty much the full range of Explorer 1 watches in front of us culminating in this Rolazor two-tone piece. What do you think is next for the Explorer 1? The question, I guess, is whether Rolex will ever go full gold. Will they go for the full yellow or ever rose gold on an Explorer? Will they go to 41 millimeter, which some people expected they might do as Rolex stopped their 39 millimeter models? But as of right now, I think we're going to see 36 millimeter models for a while, given that they just introduced them.